Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express, Driving Competitive Advantage Through Sustainability, organized by CIM Midlands. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate in the Q&A session. The presentation will last for approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by clicking on the question mark, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop or along the top or bottom if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A at the end. If you'd like to share your thoughts about today's webinar on social media, you can use the hashtag CIM events. If you'd like to download a copy of the presentation slides, you'll find them in the handout section, along with a list of additional reading resources which complement today's topic. We'll also be recording the webinar, which will be available to watch again in a few days' time on the CIM Midlands Regional webpage and CIM YouTube channel. The links for both you'll see along the bottom of your screen. So I'd now like to hand you over to Alex Glenn, Director of Catalytic Consulting, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Alex. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Glenn. Uh, I'm a marketing consultant and uh, run a business called Catalytic Consulting, uh, which is focused on helping brands to grow at pace, uh, mainly focused on health and sustainability uh, drivers. Um, in terms of today's agenda, um, I thought it would be useful just to kind of talk through a few key terms of reference uh, and then really to uh, look at um, the key shifts that are happening from a sustainability perspective uh, and then move on to look at the shifts in consumer behaviour uh, and what is driving sustainability from a consumer uh, point of view. And then moving on from there, really taking a step back and looking at the process with which different brands have uh, embraced uh, sustainability uh, over time so that can, we can see uh, the uh, variances that they have and the different approaches. And with a view to that, then taking a step back again and looking at what the future may hold and really what it means to us as marketers. So to kick off uh, just with some terminology, uh, if we look at the CIM definition of marketing, it's the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating and satisfying consumer requirements profitably. And if we take the definition of competitive advantage to mean what makes a customer choose your business over one another, I think there's an important uh, frame of reference here to kind of highlight that as sustainability becomes more important within society uh, and therefore more important for consumers, we as marketers can uh, drive competitive advantage by being under, uh, aware of those uh, drivers and trying to um, meet them with the products and um, uh, goods and services that we offer. So then just kind of move on to the shift that's happening from a sustainability perspective. Uh, I think it's clear now from what you hear from politicians uh, in the media that we do now live in a climate emergency. And it really is an issue of our time. So a big driver of this is that the UN recognised that by 2050, we do need to manage climate change um, to below uh, two degrees Celsius and preferably to about 1.5 degrees. Uh, it's covered in media, it's covered in uh, through uh, politics uh, internationally, um, but also uh, consumers are starting to recognise that it's certainly an issue of our time for the people that are on this webinar. Um, and if you think pre-pandemic, especially for anybody that has children, uh, by 2050, uh, climate change will be an issue of, uh, of their generation. And it's for this reason that if you think uh, before the pandemic, the likes of Greta Thunberg, um, school striking was starting to emerge in society as um, people increasingly educated themselves around the drives of sustainability and started to recognise that more needed to be done uh, moving forwards, which kind of led to this uh, social shift. Um, and to that point, um, the UN have really uh, driven a lot of the focus on sustainability. There's uh, an organisation called uh, IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, that measure uh, what the climate is doing and uh, what they believe uh, the climate will do in the future. And that has guided a lot of UN thinking around how to uh, manage uh, the inputs into the uh, planet so that um, moving forward we can avoid catastrophic climate change issues. Now, traditionally, uh, the ethics have clearly made sense for sustainability. 
but increasingly the economics of sustainability are making sense for countries, companies and consumers alike. And this becomes a really important um, point and really kind of the nub of the presentation, which is um, the economics that are driving uh, the choices that investors make um, are very much focused on the fact that uh, driving behavior against sustainable um, objectives is a more profitable way uh, to run organizations and to return on investment. And increasingly, uh, investment communities are proving out the return on investment of driving sustainable behavior. And what's behind that, as we'll see shortly, is that consumers are increasingly educated about the issues that we're facing into as a global society, and therefore making choices around uh, consumer products, goods and services um, that will impact the planet and generally choosing to, uh, to try to choose products that are better for the environment. And then from this, the UN have also uh, developed the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And what these seek to do is provide blueprints to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And they're worth looking at in a little more detail. Um, they're very broad reaching um, in terms of their scope, and there are 17 in total. But if we pick out just a few like gender equality, affordable clean energy, sustainable cities and communities, climate action, life below water, life on land. I think you'd agree that you'll start to see media coverage in papers, on the news, documentaries, that are bringing these issues to life and really starting to educate consumers about uh, the problems that we're facing into. And because of this uh, awareness of these challenges, consumers are starting to make um, more choiceful decisions and it's for this reason that there's the opportunity for companies to drive competitive advantage by uh, being more sustainable in their outlook. And it's really starting to shift industries uh, across multiple industries. Leaders are starting to develop sustainable business models um, that will help to achieve the UN targets. You can see it across FMCG in the energy sector and the transport sector. And further on in the presentation, we'll come to uh, bring this to life a little more. But the big question, I guess, is, well, why is this important for you as a marketer? And uh, if we look at the uh, Paris Agreement in 2015, the aim of international governments was to come together and try to limit global warming well below two degrees, but preferably uh, below 1.5. Uh, and as I said, the IPCC measure this on a, regu a regular basis. But I think the quote from Marketing Week earlier this year really brings it to life, that the obligations for how businesses report environmental, social and governance issues were laid out in the Paris Agreement. And clearly marketers who want to stand out careers in the next decade will be those who develop these skills. So let's then just kind of move on to understand what uh, is happening from a consumer perspective. I think there's no doubt now that uh, consumer data, every kind of week, few days, is increasingly showing that consumers are moving towards more awareness uh, of the issues that the planet faces, but also uh, trying to make better decisions. So if we take this report from the independence based on a one poll uh, data uh, survey, 54% of consumers feel joy when they do their bit for the environment. They quote 81% of uh, the UK are becoming increasingly concerned about environmental issues with a third saying that there's a need for brands and businesses to be more transparent in terms of the sustainability of their products and services. If we look at internet retailing, um, this survey highlighted uh, that 80% of consumers are concerned about the future of the environment. And then if we look at this piece of coverage in circular based on an EON report, uh, it states that 80% of consumers plan to buy from businesses who have made an effort to be more environmentally friendly. So across different industries and sectors, the data is showing that consumers are increasingly moving towards more, more sustainable choices. And now just kind of take a little bit of a look at uh, the FMCG sector. Um, if we take carbon as an example, the traditional media reporting of carbon emissions has been very much focused on the energy sector and the transport sector. But you can see in this uh, chart that actually, whilst energy is the biggest contributor, food is the second biggest in terms of carbon emissions and transport is smaller. Uh, and increasingly over the last four to five years, media coverage has started to highlight that our food systems do have an impact on our planet. And carbon emissions and carbon uh, usage will increasingly become a debating point for uh, the food systems that we have. 
and therefore increasingly food uh, companies are starting to think about the products that they sell, their impact on the planet, and also starting to communicate with consumers things like carbon footprinting. So you see that in a lot of plant-based sectors uh, and it's starting to roll out across different categories in store with the ambition that food uh, systems that we have uh, have less of an impact on our planet long term. And then if we kind of take some data around uh, where consumers' heads are at when it comes to diet, um, this chart highlights um, choices that consumers uh, make from a dietary perspective. And as you can see here, trying to lead a healthy lifestyle is a big driver. Uh, but actually, uh, second to that is trying to make uh, the right choice from an environmental point of view. And I think what's interesting within this chart is that um, it's clearly where the growth of behavior is coming from as well. And if you dissected this into sub-35 consumers, sub-35-year-old consumers, and uh, those consumers who are over 35, traditionally, you would have seen the data uh, highlighting that sub-35 consumers are driving this trend. But increasingly over time, what you're seeing is that the trend is being driven also by over 35s. So there's this movement of the mass markets understanding the issues at play and starting to make choices uh, based on that behavior. And I think it's fair to say that the way that people are buying is also changing uh, for good, if you excuse the pun. Um, there is certainly a theory, a theme around uh, conscious consumption. Uh, and I think the, uh, the quote here is from uh, somebody at Innocent that highlights that the way we vote for the world we live in is through the products that we buy. And consumers are starting to understand and think through how, can, how products are sourced, the impact on their family's health, the impact on our planet, and also what products say about me. So almost a social conscience around uh, the goods and services that people are buying. So it's probably worth uh, just pausing a moment to, uh, to think about the issues that that, uh, that that digs up in line with the terminology that we referenced at the start. If marketing is defined as the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating and satisfying consumer requirements profitably, I think it's fair to say that at a very top line level uh, between international governments, there is a focus on sustainable uh, behaviours to protect the planet uh, for all of our future. And that's playing into the policies that governments have uh, at country level and also um, the investment community recognizing that there is a need uh, to invest in more sustainable propositions moving forwards. I think if you can then take the uh, competitive advantage definition uh, around what makes consumer choose your business over one another and think about that, uh, framing it in terms of consumer behavior, we can start to see the consumer behavior is shifting to more sustainable um, behaviors. And therefore, the ability of you as a marketer to drive competitive advantage by framing uh, your products and services around uh, doing the right thing from a sustainability point of view not only makes sense for our planet, but makes sense for organizations to drive competitive advantage. So, having looked through that, it's probably useful to then. Um, look at how brands have embraced sustainability to drive competitive advantage over time. And I think a useful way to uh, put some context into this is to effectively use uh, the product diffusion curve, where we look at those who are innovators, the disruptors, and then uh, the early and late majority. So it was interesting in the 80s and 90s that a number of brands had sustainability locked in as a function of their product offering. So if you look at Alpro in plant-based milk, uh, corn from a plant-based meat perspective, and then uh, the likes of Prius, they were all focusing on a product proposition uh, that was really inherent to what they did based on a view that uh, sustainability would be uh, a big issue of our time and therefore trying to, uh, to go about fixing it. And if you look at publications like Metropolis that were starting to talk about the seeds of sustainability within the uh, building industry, uh, you could see that this was going cross-sector uh, and the likes of Ecotricity uh, starting to disrupt a very established traditional um, uh, energy sector through um, more natural sources of energy. So you kind of had these innovators uh, who were a little left field versus the, uh, the mainstream, but certainly focused from a product point of view about what they did. What then happened is a series of disruptors uh, came into the market 
and really started to speak in a very proud way about uh, the impacts of uh, what they could do with sustainability. Um, and this really then uh, started to challenge the market and challenge consumer thinking about what sustainability could do, and also um, drove a real pride in sustainability. I think Tesla is a very good example. Rather than trying to compete with um, the main car market on price, they purposely positioned um, as a premium price point and also drove the aspiration of the brand, something that hadn't traditionally happened and certainly not in the car market. And through doing that, they were able to outposition their competitors around the future uh, of the industry. And it's interesting over the last few years to see just how many uh, car manufacturers have recognized that they do now need to shift uh, rather than managing this decline, actually positively uh, encouraging more sustainable thinking uh, and movement to different uh, forms of transport. If you look at Patagonia, the clothing brand, a very similar situation whereby uh, they targeted a more premium shopper based on the ethics of sustainability, but made that a very engaging proposition using challenging um, behavior and marketing strategies to disrupt the fashion industry and really to raise questions about uh, what happens within the, uh, the fashion market. I think The Guardian is another great example from a media perspective, certainly in terms of coverage of uh, plant-based foods. There was really kind of no talk about it pre-2014, where The Guardian and the BBC led the charge was around encouraging people to debate the impacts of carbon uh, on the planet and also the food systems in place. Uh, heroing that uh, as, a, as a theme through their publication and encourage other media outlets to ask uh, similar questions. And then if you look at that plant-based market, you know, Oatly, Beyond Meat, really taking very challenging positions um, and questioning people uh, about their very ingrained behaviours of consumption. Uh, Oatly with lines like milk for humans, Beyond Meat, uh, really kind of taking on the meat industry and arguing that there's a different way to, uh, to eat protein. And both of those companies financially uh, have done very well, you know, Oatly uh, indeed investing in uh, the Super Bowl uh, breaks recently uh, to drive awareness of their brand, but really kind of highlight how mainstream plant-based eating is now. If you look at Greta Thunberg's approach, it was a very different approach uh, from a sustainability point of view around using children whose future will be impacted by this and really kind of inciting people to, um, to speak up and to act uh, in terms of things like school strikes so that uh, adults uh, recognize that uh, they need to go further from a policy and um, social perspective. And then I thought it'd be interesting to take a, uh, an example of a brand from the uh, Midland CIM unit and Spenbeck uh, is a really good example of this. So um, if you look at their proposition, it's the property sector, uh, company who are focused on making healthy buildings, recognizing that the environments uh, in which we work, certainly as well when we uh, move out of lockdown, really do have an impact on our well-being uh, in line with sustainability development goals, uh, but also in terms of um, the impact on the planet and therefore uh, using more sustainable approaches uh, to the property sector uh, really kind of sets them apart within the region. And then just again, kind of taking a step into what's happening these days with the early or late majority. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the multinational global companies are really starting to um, develop propositions, albeit not all of their proposition, uh, to recognize that the direction of travel is in terms of more sustainable behavior. Um, in the education sector, uh, there is education for sustainable development, recognizing that the next generation needs to understand um, the need for more sustainable behavior. If you look at Adidas, then um, already they're starting to launch parts of their range um, that are more sustainable. Uh, a very strong route in terms of plastic is a problem uh, and a commitment to use 100% recycled polyester by 2024. Uh, interestingly, kind of doing the poly ocean uh, plastic and highlighting that through use of celebrity ambassadors and sports stars to make it more mainstream. I think Albert is a very good uh, example within our industry, uh, a production company who helped to uh, drive sustainability through production, be it TV advertising uh, or the making of TV and film. And then Costa Rica, you know, for some time now have focused their tourism industry on sustainability. 
um, and it's a very uh, different approach to the travel industry, uh, but certainly encouraging people to travel in a more sustainable way. McDonald's at the moment are testing uh, McPlants, uh, mainly in the Nordics, uh, and really focusing on how they can uh, meet reduce moving forward, having recognised the need uh, for more varied product offerings. And then Unilever, uh, interestingly, have committed to a uh, billion pounds worth of uh, sales by 2025 that are based on plant-based uh, products and really embedding sustainability into their future purpose. Uh, and indeed, stating that their purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace uh, and it's why that they come to work. I think Guinness is a unique example whereby uh, they're highlighting social responsibility uh, and you know working with the Portman Group, but in a very interesting, creative way. Uh, to see a beer brand advertising water uh, is shocking, but um, to see them uh, to see Guinness branding it, uh, to my mind, is really, really clever. Uh, and highlighting that sometimes less is more and moderating your drinking is a social, uh, socially responsible way to approach the market, but doing it in an engaging, creative way that can be ownable by a brand. And I think that highlights um, just how there is opportunity to drive competitive advantage in this space. And then I think moving on to uh, the likes of Google, uh, if you look at their uh, commitment to office building in uh, King's Cross, really thinking through the whole experience of how you uh, operate in an office and uh, how the office can benefit the planet as well. So you're starting to see these multi uh, multinationals uh, really uh, move into this sustainability space. So I think the winners in this new world are really kind of embedding sustainable development goals into their purpose and operations. And in so doing that will drive competitive advantage because it will meet consumer needs. And you're seeing this through uh, all aspects of a business. So it's not only in sourcing, it can be in production, it can be in the consumption of the products, but also thinking it through to obsolescence or indeed reuse. Um, and the ability for marketers to kind of think through how it impacts consumer uh, generally, but also how the business can help the consumer through all uh, elements of the business is a very useful one. And the successful brands will be those that establish their role in this global challenge to achieve responsible, sustainable and profitable growth. So I think, you know, there's, there's clearly a, a timeline as to how sustainability has developed it's then interesting to kind of look at what the future may hold. And I think the main theme here will be that sustainability is here to stay. And increasingly, firms will base themselves around the sustainability development goals to drive competitive advantage. Uh, recently, in Singapore, cell-based meat was approved, whereby uh, people are taking meat uh, cells and then creating um, meat replication, which uh, will be more efficient and have less impact on the planet. There are very interesting biotechnology firms like Zimogen over in the US um, who are starting to put together AI and biology to try and uh, understand how they can create products from scratch without using base uh, materials, which again will reduce impact on the planet, but also uh, create new opportunities in terms of products. If you look at the aviation industry, they're starting to understand how solar, plan uh, solar panels can play their part, uh, albeit at very early stages. And in cruise line industries, they're looking at how they can reduce uh, the impact of carbon through aerodynamics. Um, so you're starting to see it across different industries. Plug Power is another interesting business um, who provide uh, hydrogen. And already within the UK, there are tests going on from a hydrogen perspective uh, in terms of all boilers using hydrogen in the future. And likewise, in the car industry. Uh, hydrogen looks like it will be a, uh, a future uh, fuel in terms of use. So I think there's a positivity around um, not only the issues in play, but also uh, the human race's ability to work with those challenges and try to solve them uh, as we go. So therefore to meet the kind of UN sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals. I think then it's worth kind of just taking a step back and saying, well, that's all very well, but how's a marketer? Should I consider uh, sustainability? Uh, and there are probably uh, a series of themes that might act as a nice jumping off point, albeit not an extensive list. Um, firstly, it might be worth in your business doing sustainability auditing to understand where you are today and then prioritise opportunities and challenges to focus on moving forwards. It may also be worth thinking about how your brands appear to consumers. So if consumers are wanting more sustainable options, is there a way that you can develop your propositions to create uh, 
winning uh, route to reframe your brand for long-term growth. Um, ideally linking those into the sustainable development goals. I think there's also a point there around how you translate the science of sustainability, which is quite complex at times, into very simple consumer benefits. I think there's also a point around plotting out the short term versus the long term. So how you may need short term uh, communication solutions to get your house in order for the longer term. Uh, and that's uh, something that sometimes uh, concerns marketers, but actually increasingly uh, where people are getting to is kind of a progress, not perfect approach. So they're highlighting to consumers uh, their direction of travel, but recognize they can't do everything overnight. From a messaging point of view, uh, clearly there's sometimes a need to craft responses to thorny issues that you're equipped to talk passionately to consumers about uh, and the benefits that your uh, brand can deliver. So again, framing things in the right way. Moving strategy into action, um, driving pace into market so that you can drive competitive advantage and how you encourage your organization to change root and branch uh, can often be difficult as a marketer, but certainly something that uh, by living the consumer in your business uh, becomes a very powerful thing to do. And then finally, there's a point around just connecting uh, with the right people who speak the same language. I think increasingly non-government organizations um, are fantastic at helping your brands and businesses um, work in a collaborative manner to reach a solution whereby uh, you're heading in the direction uh, of travel they want you to. Working with agencies um, and other marketers to speak very simple language, and then also um, aligning on your direction of travel with uh, your customers as well, so that they're aware of uh, where you're headed. So um, to summarize, we clearly live in a climate emergency and countries, companies and consumers alike are recognising the need to deliver against the UN Sustainability Development Goals. I think through this deck, we can see that there's a shift happening when it comes to sustainability. Uh, this being led by the UN, orchestrated at um, uh, intergovernmental level, uh, and then countries, companies and consumers alike are increasingly aware of these issues, um, and consumers are making purchasing decisions based upon them. And I think as marketers, we need to be aware of the drivers of the societal shift uh, and the fact that consumers are then making uh, these choices. Increasingly, companies and brands are delivering competitive advantage by delivering against the UN Sustainability Development Goals and embedding them in their business. And as mass market understanding of these issues grows, so too will mass market demand and therefore the ability to service these needs and drive competitive advantage for you as a marketer. And to that final point, you as a marketer can help this happen quicker. And I think there's an importance in this whereby uh, working as a broader marketing community, uh, if we can all drive against sustainable development goals, actually there can be a huge amount of positivity and progress uh, in this space. So just finally, a few recommendations as to uh, if you want to find out more, uh, here are a few great places to go to. I think the main point would be uh, there is so much information at your fingertips these days uh, that once you kind of get into reading and educating yourself more about it, uh, the options are endless. Attenborough clearly is a great source of information and has captured the imagination of uh, certainly our nation, but also globally with his uh, Life on Our Planet uh, documentary with Netflix, uh, purposely encouraging people to uh, globally to think about these issues. Um, there are very interesting uh, food documentaries such as What the Health, uh, books around How Bad Are Bananas, uh, which is the calm footprinting of everything by Mike Berners-Lee uh, and a fantastic read. Uh, and then uh, the likes of An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which really kind of highlights the scale of the issues we face. And if you really want to blow your hair back, then uh, David Wallace Wells is, is the place to go to uh, because some of the scenarios that are scoped out within uh, the impact our behaviours are having today are quite scary. I guess what uh, is reassuring is there are ways to solve those with the behaviours that we have. So overall, uh, I hope that it's fairly clear how sustainable uh, decisions can help to drive competitive advantage um, and deliver consumer needs at the same time from fantastic marketing. Um, if you need to get in contact with me, I'm, a, uh, I'm Alex Glenn at LinkedIn uh, or Alternatively, uh, my email is at the bottom of this presentation. So uh, I'll uh, thank you there. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Alex. So we're now going to have a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. 
you can still submit any questions you may have for Alex and we'll try to get through as many as we can and just a little reminder that if you're enjoying today's webinar and want to post on social media you can use the hashtag CIM events okay so we've got quite a few questions have come through um, so the first question for you Alex is have you any advice for brands that are already focusing on us on sustainability messaging but so are most of their competitors too. How can you stand out in a sea of sameness, all pushing the same green messaging? For instance, an example of the energy sector. Yeah, I think um, really kind of scoping out the how the proposition of your brand works in line of uh, with what you're doing. So there may be elements of uh, sustainable messaging that you're doing differently to others, uh, in which case, again, you can kind of drive competitive advantage around being different. Um, in some industries, uh, as the question kind of alludes to, there is just a similarity everywhere. But I guess then it's how the proposition of your brand and your personality can bring that to life in a more engaging way. I think if I kind of take the meat-free market uh, as an example, lots of uh, meat-free products are by their very nature more sustainable than meat products. However, the way in which people talk about them uh, is starting to drive differentiation in that category. So. I mentioned earlier in the deck beyond meat they had a very kind of loud amplified uh us tone of voice that really cut through international markets and changed the way that people thought about the category uh and that uh that point links to also the guinness example highlights some of the challenges we have as marketers around driving um the personality and the proposition and positioning of the brand linked to sustainability as well so I think there's opportunities just to drive cut through and competitive advantage in that way. Okay, so having mentioned the meat market, um, there's a question, what do you think the future holds for animal agriculture? So um, my view has always been the, the direction of travel will be less and better. Um, so generally there will be a movement towards less meat consumption, but the meat that is consumed will be of better quality. Uh, so within all of this debate you know farmers need to be part of the solution um and it will be absolutely you know uh, normal for uh both milk and uh, meat farming to uh, deliver solutions uh but there will also be lots of different options so there'll be meat free products there will be cell based products and there'll be alternative proteins um that uh, either haven't been invented yet or indeed just use very different solutions so um, I think the direction of travel will be less and better, um, but absolutely farmers will be needed to be part of the solution. Okay, um, next question. Do you think that sustainability only appeals to certain target markets? And if so, how does this impact on sustainable marketing strategy? And I guess you're looking at your curve, aren't you, with your laggards, still maybe to be convinced. Exactly that. <laughs> I think um, the purpose of kind of including uh, the definition of marketing at the heart of this presentation is, uh, to be really clear as marketers that we're trying to service needs of our consumers. Um, I think that raises two questions. Firstly, within the data that you have around your consumers, do you see it as a trend and a motivator? Um, and if so, that you know, would point in the direction of trying to service that need. Uh, and secondly, maybe taking a step back and looking a little more broadly to say, well, are there consumers that, uh, whose demands I'm not meeting uh, by not having sustainable strategies? There will be some markets where consumers just aren't switched on to uh, sustainability being a driver or may choose uh, not to um, have it as a priority in that category. So, for example, um, if uh, you work in a very indulgent category whereby uh, people are sustainable most of the time, but then make a choice into your brand uh, to uh, have a treat or not be sustainable for some reason, actually, you know, it may be choiceful to uh, say that sustainability won't be a driver for us but it's about making choices and being aware of the backdrop as to what's driving some of the behavior and hopefully uh, if there are data points that point in that direction then uh, understanding some of the plays in terms of how to do work drive competitive advantage with your offering okay um, next question um, what do you think about the danger of greenwashing as companies seek to use marketing to promote superficial campaigns that hide potentially less environmentally sustainable behaviors do you think there needs to be greater scrutiny around sustainable and in inverted commas communication so that companies are held accountable for their actions increasingly yes so um i think it's a very fair point uh i think to that point around speaking to 
people in the know in this area, non-government organisations that um, are aware of your industry, it's very useful to understand, um, have critical voices around what you're doing so that it drives better behaviour. I think um, there have been uh, you know, examples of greenwashing uh, through numerous communications. Um, the ASA uh, have started to have uh, regulations around sustainability claims uh, and that will only increase uh, as more um, uh, detail around sustainability is presented to consumers. Um, and I think it's something to be careful of, but a critical mind from a consumer point of view, again, um, doesn't necessarily do any harm because it should seek to make companies better. I guess uh, being very transparent and uh, being very clear of where you are and where you're not in that process is very important um, from a marketing perspective. Right, then one similar thing on collaboration. What about competitor collaboration rather than advantage? Um, do you have any views on sectors working together rather than trying to compete? And they give an example of collaboration by leading sports brands to align to work together to reduce impact as a collective. Yeah, I mean, again, if there's the opportunity for uh, bigger groups of people to work to a common means, it feels like that that's a, a good opportunity. Um, clearly, you know, uh, competition and, and um, collaboration just needs to kind of be uh, worked on in a very legal way. But um, working as a as a broader industry uh, seems to really kind of create cuts through and I'll kind of take examples in social responsibility of organisations like the Portland Group, um, and some of the betting uh, regulators who have actually developed um, more stringent approaches to the entire industry to better uh, the, the activities of those industries and the winners in those markets seem to be those who collaborate well uh, at that level. Right, another question um, or a comment at the beginning is um, most people, the, the, the question says, think that people think of sustainability as an environmental issue and the past year has highlighted the importance of looking after people, well-being, mental health. Do you think this could be sustainability USP? Um, as, as to communicate. Um, I mean, I think yeah. we've had a lot of changes as well, working from home versus working in an office, shopping online. Has there been uh, an impact this last year? Yeah, I totally agree with that. So um, COVID has really kind of put in focus uh, the uh, interaction between people and our planet. And I think what the Sustainable Development Goals do is broaden uh, the nature of uh, the way people think about sustainability. And through that, I think there's lots of different routes into uh, more sustainable uh, practices. And I would hope that moving forward, uh, consumers who clearly kind of care about different issues are serviced in different ways. And it may link into the point earlier about how you create um, a USP. You might actually choose to focus on different sustainability goals than maybe the industry norms. Um, and there are some good examples around that, you know, from a Patagonia point of view, um, the impact in a sort of fashion environment on uh, people and practices of those people who actually make the clothes is a slightly different way than just kind of thinking about, you know, an end user and how they may uh, care for their clothes. And I think what you'll start to see is a broadening of the way that people, uh, consumers define sustainability and therefore different, different uh, uh, differentiation models around how you meet those needs for consumers. Yeah, and then a, a question on a similar theme to the, the answer you've just given there. Could you give a, an example of best practice from an FMCG brand who is able to translate the science into simple consumer benefits? Uh, yeah, clearly, clearly I'll be uh, <laughs> subjective. But I think uh, if you take someone like Oatly, it's a great example. So um, given that they were an oat-based milk in a market that was largely soy, um, they did a very strong job of starting to talk up the benefits of oats versus soy, which, you know, increasingly soy within the food industry will, will have sustainability questions. Um, but they also did it in an engaging way. You know, the, the idea of the line of um, uh, milk for humans was a very kind of creative, catchy way of just kind of getting into people's brains and thinking through uh, their current behaviour that was very ingrained. So I think um, Oatly's neat way of uh, modernising the, the offering and the way that sustainability was communicated 
but also then the transparency, for example, carbon footprints in their products, um, talking about the benefits that it has to the planet, uh, and also uh, moving into various uh, countries to uh, encourage uh, dairy reduction was kind of interesting play into that world. So I think um, whilst it's probably uh, a very sort of standard answer, I think Oakley uh, have done that in a very interesting way. Okay, thanks. Um, next question. Do you have any advice for companies where they are on a sustainable journey, but still have some less sustainable aspects of their company, such as products that don't have any sustainability built into them? Mm -hmm. So um, I think, the there's a comment just in the deck which is uh, about progress not perfect and i think um if you have a strategy whereby uh, moving forwards you're trying to make progress consumers are fairly understanding of that i think if you can be transparent about where you are today and where you're hoping to get to uh that really helps consumers as well and then it also provides opportunity for innovation so there may be some areas where you can't reach sustainability today but you can innovate around uh, those territories to offer either better sustain, uh, better propositions from a sustainability point of view, or just uh, an entirely new proposition that uh, that means that you can delist uh, your current proposition. So I think there's kind of different routes in there whereby sometimes you can say, look, 80% of what we do is sustainable. There is 20% that we still need to work on, or you can actually kind of just take the ball by the horns and innovate around it to uh, to improve. Right. Um, a very brief question, this one. Do you think carbon offsetting is a fad? Uh, it's a very live topic at the moment. So um, I think what companies are trying to do is to use it uh, as a way to short term try to get to a, a solution. I think what will happen over the longer term is more options will become available. Uh, and there's probably something interesting in the monetization of carbon credits as well, whereby um, it will become easier for uh, for companies uh, and businesses uh, to do more to carbon offset. So I think um, it may not, I wouldn't necessarily class it as a fad, but I think it feels more like a short term solution that longer term uh, companies and will, will work around uh, to invest in the right behaviours to, uh, to reduce carbon. Okay, um, next question. Are consumers really talking about the same thing when talking about sustainability or is there a risk that everyone has a different perception? Uh, truly, you know, uh, to try and um, define the issues that our planet faces through one word is always going to be a risk. So um, I think lots of people will come at sustainability from uh, a different angle. And I think uh, to that point about being very clear on the data of your audience or your potential audience uh, becomes the important uh, factor. So for some industries and sectors, uh, carbon may be the only issue for other sectors workers rights may be an issue you know if you look at uber recently um suddenly uh, classing their drivers as employees there will be different uh, drivers of uh, audience uh, definitions of sustainability around your category or brand and really kind of understanding through traditional marketing methods of consumer uh, research and closeness to the consumer will be the way that people really drive competitive advantage for the brands they work on Okay, and I think we've got time for one final question. Um, do you th think any specific sustainability badges or accreditations for companies are better than others? Um, I'll rather boringly probably link it back to my last answer, which is uh, this is going to be around uh, variety. Uh, it will depend entirely on your kind of category uh, and brand. But I think at the heart of this is uh, those true marketing principles of understanding what appeals to your consumers that can set you apart from the competitors that you uh, have and then really communicating in a clear and transparent way to them so i don't think there's a hierarchy of uh, which accreditations are best i think the game will become around how to clearly communicate in the small amounts of time brands have with consumers uh, what you're doing and why that's beneficial to them Okay, that's excellent. We've had quite a few questions there. Um, so that's um, brilliant. Thanks, Alex. Don't forget, you can still download a copy of Alex's presentation along with a list of additional reading materials, which you'll find in the handout section. So that's all the time we have for our webinar today. I'd like to say thanks to Alex for today's presentation, CIM Midlands for organising the event, and a thank you to you all for watching. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile.
Our next webinar express is the five competencies for standing out in the sea of sameness. And that is on Thursday, the 8th of April at 1 p.m. hosted by CIM Yorkshire. You'll find it listed on the events page on the CIM website where you'll be able to find out more information and to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you once again, Alex, for your presentation and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day.